All right, all right, all right Alisa, what's your question? <laughs> I knew that, right? I, I, I should be a psychic, right? Oh, when is the first exam? That's not what you should be worried about. You should be worried about how much material do you know, right? Because it doesn't matter to me if the exam is tomorrow, this moment, I know calculus, right? I know it well that I, I can close my eyes, I can do it like this, right? I don't need to even have a piece of paper to solve the questions we have here. So that's what you should practice. So the first exam will be after we cover trigonometry. That will take us a while. The other exams, the other material is going to be compactified. The reason I do that is that uh, people uh, that register here, there might be very smart students, but very often they have no background. So, so they don't know algebra. They don't know, haven't thought about it. So I, I'm trying to build it up. You understand? In theory, you have taken pre-calculus and other things before. In practice, uh, in practice, you don't know it, okay? So I, I know that many of you don't know trigonometry, so I'll review that in some sense. I, I'll go through everything. I'll build every, every, the entire idea that takes time, okay? But that, then I sacrifice something else. So what you should focus on, guys, and that's also uh, the instrument of success, is understand the material, love the material, everything else follows. If you don't love, don't understand, and then maybe you will be successfully, you will successfully cheat me, right? In other words, I will not catch you uh, cheating on the exam. One, one reason for that would also be because I am not trying to catch you too much, right? I can ask you questions. I can just talk to you and I can see how much you understand in two seconds, right? So you can, you can copy or not copy. I can do that uh, another way. I just hope I will not uh, end up doing it. And uh, I hope you, you don't even want that situation to arise, not just because of the, uh, of, of, of what would follow, but because you don't understand the material, you lost everything from this. Anyhow, so let's uh, let's get to the material, guys. Here is here is where we uh, where, where we stopped roughly. So you look at this function f of x one plus x to the six divided by one plus x to the four. Good. And now before we solve anything, I'm going to ask you what is limit as x goes to infinity and forget about calculating it. Tell me in terms of the graph, what am I asking you to do? So imagine you see the graph on the screen of this function and I tell you calculate limit as x goes to infinity. What am I asking you to do? Not a math question, right? Something that you right away should understand. Can you repeat the question? Yes. You see this uh, function f of x equals to one plus x to the six divided by one plus x to the four. You see this, right? Now it has a graph. If I were to graph this uh, function, there would be a picture on my screen, correct? Or on your screen. Now I ask you to take limit as x goes to infinity. In terms of the picture, what am I asking you to do? The maximum or where, um, where the graph stops? Well, um, vague, vague. By the way, guys, uh, yes, uh, maybe it's a, it's a wrong day, but uh, I do want to see your faces. You know, it's very lonely for me to be the only one on the screen. I do love to see your reaction. I enjoy your company. Oh, thank you, Pablo, all right? So you see, that's the thing. I'm asking you, see, it's, it's like I send you a file. That's why you might not, not enjoy mathematics sometimes. I send you a file and you just click on it. You, you cannot open it. You have no idea what I sent you and then you just give up or oh, whatever, right? But uh, what, everything here is something that if you have the right graphics card can play, okay? So here is, uh, is this function. I'm asking you, uh, what is, what am I, uh, what's gonna happen if, what? If I take limit as it goes to infinity. In terms of the picture, what are you doing? I thought there is no limit towards. Well, in other words, when, when I say limit as x goes to infinity, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, uh, what command are you giving the computer to uh, verify, uh, to, to, to see what's happening in terms of the graph? The calculator will just keep going, adding variables one by, you know, one by one oh, by you one. See, you see, what I mean, so you're not thinking in terms of the picture. I'm asking you to scroll to the right. I'm asking you to press on the bottom and scroll to the right. Limit as x goes to infinity is exactly up. the same thing. So you understand? The line keeps going up. Sorry? If you go, if you scroll to the right, the graph is going to keep going up like the line. Yes, true. The graph will keep going up uh, and it will look like what? If, if you see when I ask what asymptotes are you seeing? You understand guys, this is, this is the first uh, thing that we need to address. 
you have to imagine something, right? So here is what I imagine. The limit as x goes to infinity, I can imagine many, many scenarios. I can imagine movies, okay? It's not uh, boring because of that. So I, I, the very simplest thing I can imagine is when you do that, if I have the graph, I can scroll to the right. So even if I'm not looking at the graph, I can imagine there is a graph. And when I ask what's happening, I'm asking what does the landscape look like if x is very much far to the right, if you traveled away from zero. And what does the landscape look like? That's what that's asymptotes, right? When I say uh, when I say what something looks like, you describe in terms of a shape that uh, makes uh, sense to everybody. So asymptote is like an analogy. Are you with me, guys? Right, your accumulators discharge over the weekend, which indicates lack of mathematics. Right, it's it's like sensory deprivation, not good. Hmm? So what's happening as x goes to infinity? What does the curve look like, roughly speaking? It grows without bounds. True, the graph grows without bounds, but more specifically, what, if you look out of the window, imagine a train. Remember I mentioned it. You are going on a train, and then you look uh, outside, the, or, or and you look at uh, the curve, right? You look at the curve. What shape does it have? Like a hill. <laughs> like a hill, sure. And what's the shape of the hill? Like a, like a bell. Like, like a, a bell. bell? Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, well, not like this. Like a big slope. Like a. Vertical <laughs> line. <laughs> <laughs> ding dong, ding dong. Yeah, so, okay, ding dong, okay, but uh, true. But uh, what does it look like if you moved to the right? <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> I broke the professor. <laughs> um, I should, I should, uh, you know, you know. Uh, let me let me tell you this, right? Uh, my uh, my uncle uh, used to teach uh, special kids, right? So uh, it was difficult to talk to him after a while. He did it for thirty years, right? Something happened to him. He goes, "This is an envelope. It has four corners. Here you see the address. <laughs> you deliver the envelope, right? So it happens to me too. So uh, what's happening to the curve, guys? The curve." starts looking like, uh, you see, think in terms of the box, think of x to the sixth power divided by x to the fourth power, right? So look at it, I can factor it out. Here is the limit factored out. You understand this, uh, uh, this uh, step, correct guys? I factor out x to the six, I factor out x to the four on the bottom. I do that because uh, I can easily see what is the limit for uh, the remaining part, right? So that looks like x squared times a number that becomes like one, do you agree? It's like x squared times one. And notice that the x squared uh, is growing to infinity, but this is like one. So this will look like roughly x squared. So on the side, you see the landscape, even in the middle, I cannot quite see it. On the side of the landscape, you might say bell, it's okay. But bell, I don't know, usually you think of the bell upside down. It's, it, I would say parabola, right? A U-shape uh, structure if I move to the right or to the left. If I can push limit to minus infinity. You understand how to read this? I just Actually, put two equations uh, at the same time. Minus can be infinity. bell shaped. Sorry? Sorry, actually bells, uh, uh, bells can actually, well, parabolas can be bell shaped. Oh, sure, sure. If, you, if, but if, if it's, it's upside down, down, like negative, negative x squared in a parabola. Sure, sure. Okay. Sure, but, but the point is again, the point is that you see it, right? You, you, it's not that you have to convince that uh, me that you see it, it's just do you see it yourself? I do. Great. The Great. What is that, uh, South Pavel? Are you watching something else? The game? Exposed. Yes. My bad. <laughs> oh my God! I lose your attention so easily. Okay, so uh, here is uh, what uh, what happens here. So let's see more carefully uh, that. Um, we are having asymptotic behavior of the form x squared. It's uh, y equals x squared, our asymptote. You have long division. You have x to the six plus one divided by x to the four plus one. 
and uh, you carry out long division, which I'm presuming you know. And what you're left with is x squared plus this expression, you see, guys? And this expression goes to zero. Everybody sees it goes to zero. Numerator is smaller. It has smaller power than denominator. It goes to zero, which means if x is very large or negative and large, then, um, then this perturbation disappears to zero. You understand it? This is like um, this fuzziness, right? I imagine this as fuzziness that becomes uh, less and less fuzzy. It, it looks more and more like x squared. Everybody sees that? So that's how I know that the shape uh, at the edges looks exactly like a parabola. Move far enough to the right, move far enough to the left. It looks exactly like a parabola. And this has very much to do, by the way, with um, probability. Even a simple thing as throwing a coin that you say uh, the probability of heads is one half has a lot to do with this uh, type of idea. Alex, please talk. Okay, so I have a question. So what, would that happen with any addi addition that you have? What do you mean? Uh, so well, if, if this like plus one was like 10,000, would that matter or no? Plus, uh, plus, plus 10,000 if, the, if yeah. what was, uh, you, you see, so this is disappearing. It was, zero, if right? it was it's infinity plus 10,000. Uh, well, infinity plus 10,000, it's just increasing without bound plus an extra 10,000 on top of it will increase yeah. without bound. Make sure that you understand this is not infinity. We call it infinity, yeah. but that's only, uh, because we're used to do that. It's really growth without bound. Uh, but I want to know, would, be, would we be able to like ignore it? Because it wouldn't matter or no? What is it? What would not matter? Uh, the, so the, the growth without it, bound multiplied by roughly one, right? So okay. clearly it's not going to prevent growth without bound. In other words, the number is, is very large multiplied by roughly one. It's going to be a very large number. You see, that's what I'm really mm. thinking very large number multiplied by something that's very close to one will be essentially, maybe it's slightly smaller than this, maybe slightly bigger depending on, uh, on how you approach one. In this case, it's uh, slightly smaller, but um, in essence, it's gonna, be the, the, it's, it's gonna be the original number. And if the original number is large, I'm getting something large. Yes? yes. Well, it, it only doesn't matter because it's so small, right? If it was bigger, then it would matter. Uh, it doesn't, what, what is, uh, this is infinity, it's approaching infinity, so it's growing without bound. It's larger and larger and larger, right? And multiplied by something that is essentially one. Multiply a large number by essentially one. If I give you a billion dollars and you multiply it by 0 0.99, in other words, you can keep 99% of it. Uh, do you want it? Yes, it's a big number, right? You want it. So it's not gonna, it's, it's, it might affect uh, the number, but it's gonna be a large number. When do you know to do long division? It's not, it, it's just what are you trying to observe, guys? You see, you you try not to think procedurally like this. If then, if then, don't memorize rules, right? What is it that you want to find? You want to understand what's limit as x goes to uh, infinity and what is the shape of the graph, okay? Let's say you want to understand what's the shape of this graph, which means look to the right, look to the left, what, what shape are you going to see? So uh, by doing this, uh, this expression, I know that if I, if I carry out long division, if the numerator has bigger power than the denominator, I carry long division and I will have uh, a polynomial plus uh, properly, uh, proper fra fraction. Proper uh, rational function is where numerator is smaller in degree than denominator. Whenever the denominator has a larger degree, this will crush it to zero. So that would be uh, the polynomial plus residue. Like residue, in other words, it's whatever, it's some sort of impurity, some sort of imperfection that if X is very large, it, this will be disappearing to zero. And here you can see that the graph looks like X squared. I hope I answered your uh, question here, right? So uh, let's, let's quickly look at this example. And uh, first I want you to tell me, look at this function, okay? I don't want to read it. You can see numerator, denominator. Can you tell me roughly what's going to be the shape of the graph if I move to the right or to the very left? The right. So if you if I scroll to the right, what's what's the shape of the graph? You don't need to tell me precisely, but roughly it's going to be what shape? What are you going to observe? Parabola? Incorrect. Is it 
uh, like a like a line to the right, maybe. Very good, a line. Now, how do I quickly see what it is, guys? Do you do you see? Look at it. It's x to the five divided by x to the four. X to the five over x to the four. The ratio is a line. Okay. So uh, it's going to be. It doesn't have to be x exactly, but it will be a line with slope one. It will be like y equals x plus a number. And here is the precise uh, procedure. So you carry long division. Again, I'm not going to explain long division. Again, it's presumed to be something that you know, guys. If not, come to office hours. Stay with me, ask me questions. So divide uh, uh, this, this is my numerator. I divide by the denominator, which has a smaller degree. When I carry out the division, I continue until, until the degree of what remains is smaller than what I divide by. So I get x plus five. Okay, so, so the answer is that this function equals to x plus five plus uh, this expression, which melts to zero. If x is very large, uh, this will be essentially zero. Do you see that? Because this will be of the form x cubed, this will be of the form x to the fourth. Again, below, I already mentioned it last time, but I will repeat it today. Uh, it, it's very easy to, uh, when, when the limit is um, of a rational function, it's very easy to judge uh, what it approaches, whether it goes to a constant or to infinity or to zero. Okay, so this part will, if X is very large, it looks like large number plus five, plus uh, well, this thing is essentially zero. You understand? So I, I will essentially be staring at the graph Y plus equals to X plus five. So I have an oblique asymptote. Good. And here is uh, the thing uh, in, in the box method. You can solve all those questions you understand, I give you one example, a second example with concrete numbers, but really when you think abstractly, it's like you are solving all those questions simultaneously. And if you understand this, this uh, general solution, you can solve every particular problem without any trouble. So everything that we did here is just an instance of a rational function here. Good. So this is tell us, uh, telling us that to figure out limits where I have ratio of two polynomials, I am just uh, picking in the box the coefficients together with their x of the largest power for the numerator and the corresponding largest power for the denominator and the limit will essentially be just like the, 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 it's going to be a contest between those two guys yes and here is why that's true look at it i i, I make one calculation when I, f I factor out x to the n factoring out x to the n is the same as having x to the n and, uh, and outside of the parentheses and then dividing each term by x to the n if i divide this term by x to the n it's just going to be a sub n plus the next term divided by x to the n it will be one over x that's remaining and the next will have possibly one over x squared until the constant ha has one over x to the n and i do the same thing for the denominator now observe what happens. Now I take the limit to either plus or minus infinity. This survives. And what happens to the number I multiply by? It's just really the same as a n over b n. Because if x is very large, all those terms are, are essentially zero. This is essentially zero. The next is essentially zero. You follow what I'm saying, guys? The coefficients that have a one over x to any power are essentially zero if x is large. So this is essentially zero. And this is essentially zero. And uh, I am essentially having x to the n over x to the m times a n b m. And that's why the limit is what it's supposed to be. Do you understand the proof, guys? I just, I just explained why I can ignore everything else and only focus on those boxes. So write yes if you understood. Good. Should be many yeses. And uh, definitely guys, don't uh, be shy. S stay, ask me questions if anything is unclear. Good. So, here is uh, here are three questions. I want you to solve them in one line. Look at them. Write a equal b equal c equal. Understand? And by the way, here I ask you to solve for is it any different when I, when I go to plus or minus infinity? Okay. So go ahead and solve that. Good. 
you see when you reply in the, in the comment just write a and b and c at the same time i want to see a line solution to a solution to b solution to c So it should take you a second, guys. If you know it well, it takes you one, one look at it and you right away know the answer. Okay. Good. Good, okay. All right, so I hope enough of you understand this. So let's move on. I will do all of them, uh, uh, Pavel, uh, which by the way, good that you are back. I, I, who won the game? It was just highlights. So, uh, I mean, it was an older game that Cleveland Cavaliers won in like 2016. Mm. All right. So, here we have it. So, uh, uh, let's see at A, guys. You see, what do I mean by put it in the box? I put uh, the leading term in the box and put the leading term on the denominator in a box. Okay. So, the limit at plus or minus infinity is the same as the limit of the uh, expressions in my red boxes, which is simply five over 10, which is one half. Guys, don't just take my, well, my statement at uh, face value. You understood the proof, correct? You understood why that is the case. I just solved the generic problem once. Yes, but you understand why, why Muhammad? You understand I can, why I do I disregard everything else? We did explain it here. That's the explanation. If you understand this explanation, you understood how to solve those problems immediately and you cannot make a mistake if you truly understood. Good. So that's five over 10, which is one half. Do we have an asymptote for A? Yes. And, uh, and, and what do I mean by an asymptote? What do I really have? Line. A line. In other words, you see guys, it's very simple. When, when somebody asks me this question, I say, okay, if I move far to the right, what am I going to see? I'm going to see a plane or a one dimensional plane will be just a horizontal line, y equals one half. If I move far to the left, I see the same thing. So even though the entire expression looks complicated, if I move away from the center, very far to the left or to the right, very far in any direction, I will see that uh, I, I get a horizontal line essentially. Make sense? Y equals to one half is the limit. So we use this to find the asymptote, yes? Yes. Uh, well, you see, it depends what you, what is it that you want to find? You see, I, I'm just, all I'm trying to do is it has to be connected in a picture. If you truly understand what you're doing, you never forget it. If you truly understand the reasoning, you never forget it. It's just natural. You don't ask what should be the next step? Should I do long division? Should I multiply, divide? It's just everything follows naturally. 
good. So uh, the answer is one half. This is not an interesting problem. There is no reason we want to solve this. And we're just learning certain ideas. Okay, so now if I do B, I also put into the box uh, leading terms. And notice it's, it's of the form six X, right? If I divide it, it's really like six over three X. So it's like two X. So essentially I will see if I move to the left or to the right, I will see the line Y equals two X plus something, right? Maybe plus a constant. So it will look like a line whose slope is two. So we have oblique asymptotes and the limit as I go to plus or minus infinity, plus infinity will be plus infinity, minus infinity will be minus infinity. You understand how you read this expression? It's just uh, saving your space. You put two formulas at once, good. And finally, you look at the last expression and you see uh, this cancels out to zero when you take limit to infinity or minus infinity. So we have horizontal asymptote y equals to zero or the x axis is the horizontal asymptote. We're at sea level. Good. I have a question for yeah, B. Yeah, go ahead. Is it 2x? Or is two it. 2x, well, I mean, you do long division, it will be 2x plus a constant. Maybe 2x, maybe 2x yeah. plus 1, plus 2, you know, it will probably be 2x plus a constant. So it would be, it would be like diagonal. It will be basically the shape will be like this to okay. uh, slope two, right? With possibly not going, does not look like a line going through the origin, possibly. You understand? That's the thing, but I can I can get most the most important part of the asymptote is the two x part. You see, so that tells me the shape. If it's two x plus one plus two, it's just moving the same line. It's really the same shape. So I can quickly uh, tell the shape of it. Okay, so now let's talk about vertical asymptotes a little bit. So a vertical asymptote is uh, simply when you have this behavior when you take limit as x goes to some number a from right or left and you get some sort of explosive behavior like plus or minus infinity. The reason it's called um, an a, a vertical asymptote because near the point A, this looks like a vertical line. You understand? So you call it a vertical asymptote because the graph looks like it's vertical. It's so steep, so it might actually be, be leaning a little, but it looks like a, a, a straight line, straight perpendicular to the x-axis line. Good. So let's try to figure this one out, guys. So find all the asymptotes, either vertical asymptotes if they exist or horizontal asymptotes if they exist uh, for this particular function. You understand what I'm asking you to do? Why do I hear ice cream truck music? Or probably it's from somebody else. It's not um, mine. You think yeah. I'm trying to lure children or something? No. Oh, good. I don't like children. Some of my math problems are about uh, that specific topic. Yeah, me too. Oh, Ikra, today you are not visible. That's too bad. Kashu and Chan, are you here, by the way? Kashu and Chan. Interesting. Heidi Valeriano. Yes. You're here? Yes. Great. Jun Sheng Mai. Yes. 
great. All right, Alex uh, says it's uh, it's uh, one half. What about the rest of you? What do you say? Joshua Lim, you're here. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Great. Mari Yumj, whatever that uh, the ending. Oh, are you here? How do you pronounce your name? Miriam. Miriam, makes sense. All right. So, uh, what's 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 the answer to that? Yes, uh, Miras Mirasib Miras. Mir Sabirov, sorry, Mir Sabirov, right? So it's, uh, you say vertical is five over three, horizontal square root of two over three. Let's, uh, let's look at it, guys. So, so actually, you only looked at plus infinity, I think, not at minus infinity. Uh, you can get horizontal asymptotes uh, if you go to the right or to the left. So first of all, everybody agrees that uh, at five over three, I have a vertical asymptote. That's because denominator is zero if I plug five over three. And on the numerator, it's not zero. So that means if I approach five over three, this denominator becomes close to zero, while the numerator is becoming close to a particular number. So it doesn't matter what this number is, some positive number divided by either plus or minus infinity, depending on whether or not denominator is zero plus or zero minus. You, everybody understands why uh, five over three x equal to five over three is a vertical asymptote, the only one we have here. Your silence, I presume, means yes. So now let's take x going to infinity. Now here I have to, I, I can go ahead and do the same thing I did before. So notice there is a square root. So this uh, is now the most general type of function we have considered. It's called algebraic function. Algebraic functions are the ones that allow you to use radicals and uh, multiplication, addition, division, everything like that, right? So multiplication, um, the addition and division, it's rational function. If you add to it radicals, that becomes algebraic. That's the biggest category of functions we have considered so far. So then how do I figure out what's the limit there? So I factor the biggest power from denominator and within the root, I factor out x squared for the numerator. So it's root of x squared times two plus one over x squared. You see this? So far, everybody understands. Yes, guys. So again, I do not see your reaction. I, uh, and it's harder for me to know whether I'm over explaining or under explaining. Now here is a step that I think a lot of people get confused at. So root of product is product of roots. Yes? So I can do this, root of something multiplied by something, it's root of the first thing times root of the second thing. And it's not arbitrary, you see, I mean, there's so many things to explain, it's not arbitrary to me because well, I understand why it works. Good, so now root of x squared is the absolute value of x which because x is going to plus infinity is just simply x. So I can take limit as x goes to infinity, it's x over x, I cross them out. And now I have root of two plus one over x squared divided by three minus five over x. And when x is large, it's really like root two over three. So it's radical two over three. That's when x was going to plus infinity. It means that if I move to the right, I will see a horizontal asymptote y equals root two over three, correct? Now, what happens if I move to the left, guys? Can you, before I open up my solution, what, what happens if I push limit x going to minus infinity? What will the solution be then? Mm 
God Hadi, God Miras, Mir Sabirov, I'm sorry, I always uh, want to pronounce it differently. Mir Sabirov, correct? That's very good. Some of you notice it. So the answer is it's exactly the same procedure as before, but something else is happening here. Look at it. I do the same procedure as before. I factor out the root of x squared, and then I make it absolute value of x, but this time I make it minus x. Why do I make it minus x? Well, x approaches to minus infinity and absolute value is supposed to make it positive. If x approaches minus infinity, x is a negative number. It needs an extra minus to make it a positive number. So minus x, some people don't uh, notice that minus x is not a negative number. Minus x is a positive number. You follow? Because x is just, a, it just you, put, you put a cover on a number, that number was negative. If in front of the cover you have minus, you have two negatives, it's a positive number. So you cancel them out and you get minus root two over three. So if I move to the left, I see a, a totally different horizontal asymptote, y equals to minus root two over three. Good. And here is just a quick explanation why people make a mistake. I know that from previous semesters, I'm sure some people here think, uh, why is there a negative? So a lot of people say root of x squared equals to x, but that's not true. Look at this example, root of minus three squared, here minus three is x, minus three is a negative number. Root of minus three squared, it's really root of minus three. When I square minus three, it's nine. So it's root of nine, which equals to three, which equals absolute value of minus three or minus x. Do you follow the explanation guys? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so it's, it, uh, so root of X squared is not canceling uh, out entirely only when X is a positive number. In general, it's absolute value of the number. So that will be what? Absolute number of the val of the number is X only if X is not negative and it's minus X if X is negative. All right. I hope you understood it guys. If not, uh, this is what I call algebra. This is definitely something that you want to be sure that you cover, that you understand why it works. Uh, wait, before you uh, Somebody asks me something, you, you became muffled. I don't, I don't know what you said. Hello? Okay. Now here is my next problem, guys. Oh, hey, hello. I'm hey, sorry. Hello. Um, can you, can you scroll? Because I'm still confused, like, um, the other one, I kind of, I didn't, uh, can you scroll up? How is it still um, five over three? That's, uh, that's why is it, well, ah, you mean vertical, why is it five over three? Yeah. Yes, okay. So simply look at it, right? So what happens, the denominator is zero. So when you, when you see those functions, uh, ask yourself, when do we have denominator equal to zero? So this equals to zero, if X equals to, to five divided by three. Do you agree? So three yes. X minus five equals to zero if X is five over three. Never mind, I got it. Yeah. Got it, right? Can, and then, yeah, and, then I, and then I do the following. Then I take limit, uh, if I approach five over three, denominator looks like zero plus or zero minus and numerator looks like a positive number. If I divide a positive number by zero plus or zero minus, it's like I'm dividing by a tiny number. Divide, divide um, fixed number by a tiny number and you get infinity. Okay. Good. Uh, by infinity, I mean growth without bound. You just, you get tired saying growth without bound, you call it infinity, but that's not correct. And here is uh, the next question, guys. I, I wonder what you will say for it, okay? Here, I want you to calculate first limit as X goes to plus infinity, and then tell me what's limit as X goes to minus infinity of this expression, which also is algebraic. We don't use division here, but we use square roots. The quicker we solve this, guys, the faster we go to really interesting things. At least I think they are.
So plus infinity is square root of one uh, minus infinity. So I, Alex, I'm not sure I understand uh, for this example, do you have a number? What are you getting at the end? So you're saying that if you go to plus infinity, you get square root of uh, one. In other words, you get one, but that's what you're saying. If I move to plus infinity, correct? Yeah. Okay. And if I move to minus infinity, I'm getting minus infinity, you're saying, yes? Yeah. Okay. We shall see. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We shall see. Oh, negative 2x is uh, uh, neg uh, negative infinity, right? Uh, that would make it. See, guys, so you do have to solve lots of problems. But you see, we cannot do it in the middle of the class. I wish we could, of course, but... Uh... Nassim, uh, what, what do you want to say, Nassim? The professor, since in the question we don't have denominator, can we multiply it by um, the square root of uh, x squared plus 1 minus x over the same thing? Well, you can do anything. That's the rule. You can do anything as long as you're not changing the meaning of the expression. As long as you are not uh, jumping from one expression to another, that's not equivalent. Right? So oh, okay. you don't have, a, you, you don't have uh, the division here. You are correct. So if you want to, if you, you can, you ask yourself, can I reduce it to the previous problem? I mean, in all previous problems, I have a division sign, correct? Yeah. So if you, if you know what you want, it's called wishful thinking. Know what you want and, and figure out how to get there. Yes, I see what you're saying, uh, Mir Sabirov, right? You mean uh, by the conjugate, the same thing, but plus X. Yes, yes, that's correct. I'll wait another two minutes, guys, uh, and then I will reveal the answer. Again, in office hours, we can practice plenty, you understand, guys? Yeah, that's what, what, what they are especially for. We can stay. I even have new device, so we can try it out. I mean, uh, I can write stylus and whatnot. See if it works. Oh, well, Pavel says one. Yeah. You see this, guys? This is uh, what I have here, right? So uh, we can check. We can check if it works well. All right, let's solve it together, guys. So here is my first suggestion. All we can do is this, right? Look at it. 
uh, we plug in infinity and it's infinity squared plus one, it's infinity, square root of infinity is infinity minus infinity, it's infinity minus infinity is zero. So the answer is zero, do you agree? Infinity minus infinity is zero. Did I reason correctly? Not only is this infinity minus infinity, well, infinite, a huge number of infinity minus infinity doesn't always have to equal zero. It can be a huge number. You are absolutely correct, uh, Alan, right? So it, yeah. it is not correct reasoning. Why is it not correct reasoning? Because what you see here is uh, when the symbol is not good, it's the same thing that happens when you have synonyms, right? You are caught by uh, assuming that uh, the same sounding word or similar symbol means the same thing. Look at it. This thing just means growth without bound minus another growth without bound. It does not talk about how fast is this growth happening, right? Maybe this growth is happening way faster than the growth you subtract or the other way around, right? So it, this, this is ambiguous. For instance, suppose that uh, each day you are earning $1. So $1, $1, $1. So the earnings are increasing to infinity with the days, correct? But suppose that your debt is, is increasing at the order of square of the, now, of the dollar. So $1 squared, then, uh, then $2 squared, $3 squared, it will be minus infinity. You're getting into debt because uh, the amount removed from you is more than the amount gained. You understand? But both parts grow to infinity. Le this is linear growth. That would be then quadratic growth. So this is not correct reasoning. So let's try something else. And somebody here was asking, uh, so I think Nassim was, was, was asking about it, right? And some other people, you notice that I like to have a denominator in those problems, correct? So how can I obtain the denominator? Oh, well, nice way to do that possibly is to multiply and divide by the same expression because they cancel to one. Now I see this as A minus B, so I multiply by the conjugate A plus B as, uh, uh, Mir, Mir Sabirov, I don't always butcher it. Uh, well, well you, you understand. So uh, Mr. M has, uh, has commented. Good? Make sense? Are you with me, guys? Mir Sabirov, did I pronounce it correct? Yes, great. Mir Sabirov says this, okay? So multiply, divide. So numerator becomes what? Numerator, you just, you just uh, this guy squared minus this guy squared. So I just have one in the numerator and it's divided by an expression that clearly goes to infinity. The denominator obviously goes to infinity. Do you agree? So it's one over a large number. So the answer is zero. So they do grow uh, to uh, at the same rate. So the answer is zero. On the other hand, uh, if I were to look at the limit as X goes to minus infinity, look what happens here. So I, I can plug in minus infinity in the sense that it's a plug in a large number in size with a negative in front of it. That's uh, roughly infinity and minus minus infinity is plus infinity. So they assist each other in growing. If you have a number that grows without bound, and, and you add to it another number that grows without bound, together you have something that grows without bound. So there is no ambiguity at limit as X goes to minus infinity, okay? Now guys, in here I will try to demonstrate for you uh, why it's much be more beneficial to understand rather than just to do some, something silly. Uh, so here, calculate this limit. And if you want to, I, for example, look at it, I don't do any algebra, I right away know the answer. You see this limit, I know right away what's the answer. You, you can try algebra if you want.
All right. Do you hear background noises, guys, or not as much? So uh, no. no background noises whatsoever. It's hard for me to tell because uh, I, I, you see, you heard the ice cream truck, but I don't know what you hear, what you don't. Great. Where did Pavel go? Pavel, where are you? Ah, oh, here you are. Great. You cry, you hear? Yes, Professor. Oh, great. You know, we cannot uh, live without black caviar, so, you know. It's scarce. Oh, you're American, Alan, right? So they don't tend to like it. No, I'm Russian, even though I don't like admitting it. Uh, why don't you like admitting it? Because I blush and get embarrassed at times. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'm not Russian, but I pretend to be just to make jokes. Hmm. Okay. Well, Ukrainian, same thing. Anyhow, so uh, <clears throat> what's the answer, guys? All right, let me tell you the answer. Radical infinity, my God, that's a very cool infinity. So no, the answer is minus three divided by four. I can look at it and tell you. You should have, of course, figured it out uh, by looking. I will show you harder problems. So this one you should have told you should have told me within uh, a minute. What do you do? Same thing we did before. You multiply by the conjugate. You see, we have minus here, so there is a conflict. Infinity minus infinity multiply by the conjugate. You love most people. That's what they, once they learn multiplying by the conjugate, they love doing it. You multiply by the conjugate and uh, simplified numerator. It's just this number squared minus this number squared. So that's what we get, correct? And uh, uh, the four X uh, squared cancels. I'm left with minus three X on the numerator. And here I can factor out an X. You see, I factor it from the root. I just don't want to go through all the annoying steps. Factor it out. And now we have root of four plus two, which is two plus two, which is uh, minus three over four. You understand the explanation? This is the explanation I'm giving so far. That's not what I do. Okay, so confirm guys that you understood. Say yes, if you understood uh, how I solved this question, at least how I presented the solution. And uh, you should know how to do it yourselves, okay, guys? Because when you understood what I went through, so what about you doing it from scratch? What happens to the minus three over x? Well, when x is large, it becomes zero. Look at it, x is large. All I'm saying when x, when I say x goes to infinity, uh, okay. I'm saying that this x is very large, so three over x is, is, is crushed to zero. So it's like root of four. You understand what I do here? I factor out, first of all, an x squared, and then once I factor it out of the root, it becomes X because X is positive. So a uh, root of X squared when X is positive is, is just X. If it's, if X is negative, it will be minus X, good. So I can cancel those X's and I'm left with minus three over root four plus two, which is minus three over four. Okay. And uh, here is uh, one more. One more. 
You see, I, I would, what I would have enjoyed doing is I would have let you think about it, but I think it will take you an hour to do it. Actually, I think many of you will not do it even after an hour, in, in, not even after two hours. We can check, but I, unfortunately I don't have time to wait one hour. I'll, I'll give you five minutes. It's the cube root.
Well, I see you're still working. I have to move on guys because of time. I would have otherwise be sitting here for an hour, two hours, three hours, seeing how long it will take you. Now, the answer is, I look at it, the answer is minus five divided by 12. Done. Yes, I'm right. And uh, don't worry, I did not, uh, I did not uh, tell you how to solve it. I could have solved it your way, the algebra way, but that's not what I do. So I will explain what I do to you later on in the course. One thing that I do is I think, I recognize. You see, it's not exactly in the book. How they don't tell you to solve this problem the way I will teach you to do it. Is that when you think about, uh, about uh, the material, you realize not only, you see, you don't go ahead and do something. I, I, you, you think about and ask yourself, what is it that you are doing? Yes. What is it that I am doing, guys? You see, so a lot of people, they just I say, start hammering and they go, right? Same thing happens uh, when, they, when they are receiving order. Okay, let's level the curve or whatever else they are told to do. Let's say just go and, uh, and begin executing. But uh, uh, what you should do is stop for a moment and ask yourself, do I understand what am I doing and why am I doing it? What are the reasons for it? Right, <laughs> from, from starting from the material and going even back and asking yourself, why are you in this class? What is it that you hope to accomplish? Or are you just going like this with, with uh, closed eyes? Well, I have to jump over a hurdle. Okay, so I will, uh, this, all the limits in, uh, in your book that are slightly difficult, uh, they are what I call derivatives in disguise, right? It's just that uh, is your ability to recognize similar ideas, is it good or not? If it's good, you, you think that the entire book is one problem. If it's bad, you think every single problem is new, okay? That's the, I'm far slower than you are in, in thinking, I'm pretty sure about it. Because uh, for example, I go to the grocery, right? To the grocery store, do you think I'm good at giving change? I'm terrible at it. I am not good at counting. Uh, I'm not good at adding. I'm not good at any of those procedures. I'm just good at uh, abstract thinking and logic. Okay, so I understand general solutions. That's what I do. Okay, so let's talk about infinity and paradox. Again, back to a few paradoxes and some of them, they deviate into so many interesting uh, problem. So one paradox, guys, that you might have heard about is Zeno's paradox. And if we were in the same class together, I would have presented it this way. I would say that you are not able to leave the classroom, or in fact, uh, any motion is impossible. And uh, here is roughly what one of the Zeno arguments that uh, you can think here, right? So, so to get from where you are to the door, you have to go half the distance. But to go half the distance, you have to first go a quarter of the distance. But to go a quarter of the distance, you have to go one eighth of the distance. And to do that, one sixteenth. And to do that, one over 32. And there are basically infinitely many points in, uh, in, in, over here. You understand? So there are infinitely many steps that uh, you have to take even to make one step. And uh, of course, uh, you have experienced, uh, or at least you believe that you have been able to walk out the door, right? You move around. So you might think, ah, oh, I'm not quite sure what's going on, or maybe something about this reasoning is false, but you are able to stand up and walk. I can guarantee you that in presenting this uh, argument in a slightly different form, mathematically equivalent, but different form, you will get the same conclusion. You will think that you cannot get somewhere. Well, let's check that. We will, go, uh, we will go to the same argument again. I want to show you the difference between true infinity and the limit. Okay, so for that, let's consider this creation uh, experiment. So in this experiment, listen carefully, we will have a universe and we will fill it with stars. We will, we will fill it with infinitely many stars uh, in one minute. Very similar, look at it, one half, it's just like this one half. So here is how the experiment is going to work. Um, the stars, you can imagine that they have a number inside of them or some way to count them, right? So, so one half minutes before 12, stars one through 10 come to existence and star 10 immediately expires. So this is the situation half a minute before 12. This is your universe, you have nine glowing stars one through nine, and the 10th star has expired. It disappeared, it vanished. 
Make sense? So you have nine times one stars in the universe. So far clear? Do you understand what happened uh, half a minute before 12? Next, one half squared minutes before 12, stars numbered 11 through 20 will appear in the universe and star number 20 expires. Good. So we have nine times two stars in the universe. In step three, stars numbered 21 through 30 appear in the universe one half minutes cubed before 12. 30th star also expires. That's the situation. So we have nine times three stars in the universe. And in general, just uh, so you understand in step N, I just list those stars. It's not important. This is just saying what happens at a general step. So I don't have to go and, and speak of each step separately. I'm able to general, make a general statement. Okay. So at the end step one half to the end minutes before 12, the next batch of stars will appear. And it will be actually stars 10, 10 times N minus nine all the way to uh, 10 to the N, uh, to, sorry, 10 times N that will appear. And then uh, the 10 to the N star will expire. You have nine times N stars in the universe. So that's experiment one. And the question is question one, record your answers, guys. I will answer questions only once we cover experiment two. I want to do them together. Question one is how many stars are in the universe at 12? So ask me questions if something is not clear and then I want to hear your answers. How many stars in the universe at exactly 12? What are we doing, Christian? Are we listening to something else? We don't care about the universe. Impossible to calculate. Uh, well, what do you mean by that, Pavel? Because it um, it would not stop. It's like it's like above infinite, in a way. Would not stop. It keeps on going. Well, that's when we approach 12. But once we are at 12, we have finished uh, the universe. But do we approach 12? Well, uh, that's a good question. So you say we do not approach 12. Yeah. Okay. Note that, Pavel. Uh, so everybody heard it, guys. Lock it. You don't approach 12. Good. Uh, thank you for, for your comment. I really... Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about it. So you will not approach 12 is Pavel's answer. And uh, four, you are saying it's going to be infinity, correct? And what uh, other people are saying? Infinite, I don't know. Okay. Why, Paul, why did you say that it won't approach 12? Well, that's what he said. I didn't say that. That's Pavel said that. Right, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep the answers. Uh, so there are going to be two experiments. I would like to compare the solutions. So you understood what happened in experiment one? Stars number one through 10, 10 disappears. Then, um, then uh, 11 through 20, 20 have disappears. 21 through 30, 30 have disappears and onwards. A bunch of them disappear, but uh, the net gain of new stars is, is nine, correct? With each step, we have extra nine stars. So it becomes, the universe becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. Exactly, uh, Joshua, 10, 20, 30, and so on, they disappear. Okay, so now let's listen to experiment uh, number two. And in experiment number two, we do a similar thing. One half uh, minutes before 12, 
stars one through 10 appear in the universe, but star one immediately expires. So you have a net gain of nine stars, correct? As before, nine times one. Step two, one half squared minutes before 12, stars 11 through 20 pop into the universe. And this time star two expires. It, used to, it survived the first step, star, but now star two is expired. You understand? We have one and two expired. We again gained an extra, well, nine stars. So it's nine times two stars that we have in the universe at step two. Step three, it's 21 through 30 that appear, but star number three expires. And again, we have nine times three stars in the universe. And the general step is that at the end step, the nth star is disappeared, it expires, right? So you still have nine times n. So how many stars for the second experiment at 12? Any different than before? Or it's this, is it the same number? So maybe you can, can give me the answer in your, in your messages for let's say experiment one, call it A and give me the answer and B, give me the answer. So I can see it in one row. Don't press enter, just type it A and, you, and what you think, is it infinite or never reaches 12 or who knows what? A and B, is there any difference between A and B? Um, can, can I say a thought? It's, it's exactly what I want you to say. Okay. So, um, like, like, um, I forgot, I, I forgot his name. Like he said, right. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's, um, it's not gonna, it's not gonna reach 12 because the limit is 12. Right. So, um, for, because if I'm looking at this, right, it says 10 and minus minus nine. Right. Um, so you, so you're getting you get, you're basically getting all the stars in this one in this one area right each each time that it grows right but then why would you um why would you because it it couldn't be an infinite it couldn't be infinite because this is this is a set time limit on here it stops at it stops before 12 well, so what Mm -hmm. No, no, you can, you can, you can keep, you can keep going. Uh, well, so first, I'm very interested in what, uh, in what you're trying to say. So it seemed to me, first part of your speech seemed to me that you and Pavel do not believe, which again, Pavel actually said something about uh, problem B. Uh, so you and Pavel do not believe that 12 hour will ever be reached. Do I, uh, did I hear you correctly? Why Pavel did you believe that it will be reached in this? In the second, in the second uh, example. So in the first example, it's not reached. What, why should it be reached in the second? I mean, you seem to change your mind for the second question for some reason. I mean, I don't know. I do feel like it's the same thing applies. Can you scroll up a little bit on the problem, like to the? Scroll up, so guys, you understand it's but a the picture. Problem, but the problem says before twelve. So no, so that's that's the procedure. You understand? So what will happen? Um, in other words, the stars will appear. Uh, at exactly those moments. So I divided the time interval into uh, one half. So I look at here 12. So I have one, one half is when the first procedure happens. Uh, one half of that is the next procedure. One half of that is the next, you understand? So, I, so before 12, it's, it's just, it's very similar, by the way, it's very similar to Zeno, except that uh, my division is, is going from here. It doesn't matter, you understand? It's, a, it's exactly the same division that I performed here. Zeno's division, one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, and so on. Make sense? Except I did it for time. So first, it was interesting that you and Pavel said that uh, you never reached 12 because I think mathematically, you are then uh, believing the same thing as Zeno would say, that you do not reach the door. Not reaching 12 is not reaching the door because you have all those steps. It's mathematically equivalent. You might disagree, of course. You might say that time is of entirely different nature, but usually when you think of time, you think of the arrow of time, which is just um, very the same as the arrow of space. It's modeled by the same process. Okay, but you're taking away, but you're taking, 
I let me just think about this a little bit more. Okay, I I really want to hear your your thoughts, guys. Right? Unfortunately, I do not see you at the same time, and it's eerily quiet. I do not even know if uh, if I reached you. It's like in that song, you know. I need to play for you good songs. I I do have the belief, guys, that because uh, um, because people don't read enough and don't listen to good enough music, uh, that their imagination gets dull. I think I think that I don't I don't agree that it will never reach twelve minutes. I think that all you're saying is just based on what you told us about Zeno's experiment that it we don't know how many steps there will be but that's kind of irrelevant as long as we know that it will always be a function of nine times however many steps so uh, that's so there are several things do you agree that with each procedure we gain a net uh, nine balls correct nine uh, stars whatever you call them right so each time yeah. you perform the experiment, uh, uh, each time you perform a step, you, you have a net gain of nine. So the limit will be infinity because net gain means as you approach 12, as, as time approaches 12, you accumulate procedures. So it's like limit as nine goes to, as n goes to infinity, nine times n will be infinity, correct? So uh, as I approach 12, the sky is becoming brighter and brighter and brighter with each step and, and becoming brighter, faster and faster and faster. You see yeah. a dark sky lighting more and more and more, and it's very bright. Uh, and the time is closer and closer to 12. So the question is what happens at 12 for, for experiment one and mm -hmm. what happens at 12 for experiment two? Or maybe it's the same thing that happens. Maybe we don't reach 12 somehow. You see, mm -hmm. that, that's at least what I heard from Pavel and possibly um, James uh, possibly agrees. Right? Am I right, James, that you agree with that, uh, that you don't reach 12? Yes. Yes. And guys, uh, so it's a, it's a sort of a thought experiment, right? You might, we will say quite a few things about it. You can think of it as an allegory. You can think of it as an actual thing. You can think of it as a meaningless thing, right? But, uh, but think of it. What about uh, Miss Minkowski? What do you think? That means Ra Rachel Minkovich. B, oh, interesting. Okay, so Rachel says A is infinity and B, no stars. In other words, zero stars, correct? Interpretation, Rachel? Great, thank you, Rachel. Rachel said something interesting. What about the rest of you guys? Uh, Fu, what do you have to say? Hmm. Um, I kind of agree with Rachel. With Rachel, okay. So Fu and Rachel are in the same camp. Interesting. And then we have uh, Pavel and and um, and James in the other camp. So Pavel, you say if we were to reach twelve, you agree with them. Assuming you reach twelve, you're saying in the first part it's infinite, in the other part it's zero. Well, you, we have quite interesting uh, ideas here. What about the rest of you guys? What about uh, you, Christian, and the other people that I mostly don't know? Um. If you need any, sorry, I'm hurrying you up, guys. So let me know if you need any elaborations on those experiments. And this relates to probability, by the way, right? Uh, if, if you're interested, I might not have time to show it in class, but uh, we'll see. I might show it in office hours.
Um, how about if it never reaches 12? We will address everything you said. Uh, I just, uh, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember, first of all, what you have, uh, what sort of idea. So my point, first of all, whenever you see it never reaches 12, I hope you realize the similarity between that procedure and trying to reach the door to uh, go out of the room. It's a very similar idea. Of course, you might say time is an entirely different creature, but that's not usually how you think of it. You speak of the arrow of time. But, all right. At least I see uh, that's another thing. You see, I told you what made me interested in mathematics. Uh, funny enough, I just found this uh, German girl, which ended up also being actually Russian, but she speaks pretty poor Russian. I mean, she's a foreigner essentially, right? But uh, she was reading Immanuel Kant. You know, he's Kant, right? Uh, he spoke about, he had a theory about time and space that I found pretty interesting. He said those are intuitions a priori, which means those are not in some sense, though it's in, in the modern language, I would say it's like a software with which you are trying to understand. Ah, in what country am I, Pavel, right? That's a good question. Where, what, where do I think I am? Maybe I'm in Germany, right? Do you believe I'm in Germany? You can use your, your awesome deductive powers and figure out where I am. I think you mentioned Obedi. something some, uh, a few lessons ago about how it's not the same time as it is for us. Yeah. Like a bit where you are. So jetzt versuche ich äh, ihr alle zu überzeugen, dass ich in Deutschland bin. Glauben Sie mir? Do you believe me that I'm in Germany now that I spoke German? Israel. That's also interesting. That's a good idea. I know. I speak Hebrew. So uh, maybe I'm in Israel. Maybe I'm in Germany. Or maybe I'm in New York. It's all actually possibly non-existent because the, the most interesting thing is most likely I don't exist. Right, uh, that's definitely according to Immanuel Kant. I still remember uh, in high school, I mentioned the time and space and intuition of prior, and there was this uh, common sense girl, and she got, oh my God, uh, she was so annoyed, she actually left the room. That was pretty funny. I understood that, I always remember, I always thought that's a pretty interesting point, truly, right? You can think yourself uh, to death. So, Back to this question, guys. I, I'm sorry I distract you. I, I, you understand what I'm asking. Or I'm hoping that uh, you realize that those are potentially extremely interesting questions, and I can show you. Uh, I can show you what they are. I will show you a few things about them, hopefully. Okay. So, the first experiment. What was happening is that uh, stars 10, 20, 30 were disappearing. Correct. And uh, in the second experiment we are also gain, are gaining batches of 10, but star number one disappears in experiment one, star number two disappears in experiment two, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, let me know guys, if you want to think about it longer or you want to discuss it together. Can we discuss it? You're ready to discuss mm -hmm. it? So type that you're ready to discuss. I don't want to spoil anyone's fun. Together. Okay, so let's discuss it, guys. So first of all, those that said that time does not reach 12, it's not at all stupid to say that. Not at all, okay? Because, uh, well, for, so let me, let me first try to, I never thought that, for example. I, when I, I never thought time will not reach 12 because, you see, that's, that's very good in terms of uh, poetry. Time does not care what you do. Uh, and I should play you a good song about it, right? It's in Russian, that's the thing. It's, it's by Akujavi, and, and they say, which means, uh, and time is, is hurried by an indifferent coach. And the horses ask to run forwards, okay? And that's how I tend to think of time. I tend to think of time as not reacting to you at all. You can do whatever you want, right? Time is just ticking on. It's your job or uh, whatever entity is producing all stars to, to fulfill the conditions of the procedure, to get through each step. You understand? That's how I thought of it. But remember, guys, there is something extremely interesting, which is, by the way, mentioned in, in the physics book. If you ever bother reading the physics book that I showed in my office, the one that I use for um, MIT students, right? 
it's not really a book for uh, for uh, um, relative uh, relativity theory but what will happen guys so let me ask you this simple question if you travel at this maybe you heard of it i'm not i'm not asking you to understand or not but imagine you board, board a rocket and you travel at the speed of light to a star that's uh, 200 light years away how long will it take you to arrive there 200 light years away in other words light year is the distance traveled by uh, light in uh, one year so if something is 200 light years away how long will it take you to get there if you are moving at the speed of light 200 years well it's a tricky question it will be 200 years uh, to the people that are observing you to you it will not take any time you will board the rocket and if you could stop it will be right away because time stops when you travel at the speed of light okay so uh, uh, at least in relativity theory that's the funny thing about it, right? So you will not age enough, you will just time will freeze entirely if you travel at the speed of light. Uh, so, so in terms of relativity theory, time does respond or it seems to respond to, uh, to what you are doing. That's why it's not stupid to say that time reacts to it, but that's not how we naturally think of time. Naturally, we think that those procedures can, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's up to the entity to accomplish it. It's up to something that is creating those stars to fulfill the conditions and time does not care at all. It just moves at the same steady, absolute uh, way, okay? So perhaps time will, perhaps, uh, time will, will stop, perhaps not. If time does not stop, as I, I would say that uh, this, this does not, you don't need to move at the speed of light. You actually have to see that if you actually are moving any object, that's why I made it a creation. Right? In other words, if you actually move an object, you have a speed limit, which is apparently the speed of light. But there is no, at least not that I know of, a speed limit for something to appear, to come into existence. Okay, so they're just coming into existence and vanishing out of existence. So uh, then, you, you ask yourself, that's what you do in mathematics. You, you try to avoid complicated thinking and think very simply, sometimes like a monkey. It, it, how do you know that there is something in the universe? How you know it's if the universe were a bag, you will put your arm into the bag and you will try to pull out a fruit. So can you pull out a, a star in the first experiment, uh, 12? Can you pull, will there be a star? We imagine them as labeled one, two, three, four. Will there be a star at 12 in, in the second experiment? Hmm? Why are you so quiet, guys? Yeah, but the thing is, is that it always says before 12. For, well, it, it, the, it's, it's, it's what, what created the star. Unless I said that it will, it's expired, it will not expire. So star number one begins to burn half a minute before 12 and will continue burning until it expires. And there is no mentioning of any expiration in this procedure. So in experiment one, star number one will continue to burn at 12. Star number two will continue to burn until 12. And all the other stars, except for star number 10 or any other star that is divisible by 10. You understand? Because those are the ones that disappeared. Make sense? So they continue to burn. You have infinitely many stars because every integer other than integers divisible by 10 continue to exist in this universe. Now for the second experiment, Star number one does not burn because it disappears after first procedure. Star number two disappears by the second procedure. Star number three disappears by third procedure and so on and so on and so on. You agree? That also has to do with that paradox where I was giving you the money, one pile at another. If I give you $2, then I give you $4, then I give you $8, one at a time, the limit will approach infinity. But if I give you the pile right away or ask you what it is, it's not the same answer. You understand? When you go to calculus two, you understand infinite series as gradual. I'm, I'm pushing the piles like this, then like this, then like this. It's not the same as giving you the equivalent of the money right away. Similarly, in both experiments, limit is infinity. The number of stars increases. However, at 12, in the first experiment, infinity survives because you have stars numbered one, two, three, nine, eleven, 11, and onwards. Basically, every integer that's not divisible by 10 continues to exist at 12. There are infinitely many such integers, correct? Now, in the other experiment, it cannot be star number one, it expired after first experiment, star number two expired after second experiment, and in general, star number n 
expires at the nth experiment. You understand? So that means that there is, if, you, if, you, if a star exists, then you can look at it and it will have a number. But that number will be, let's say, 100. If it's 100, it disappeared by the 100th experiment. So it cannot be 100. It cannot be any number. So it cannot be any number n because the nth number disappeared by the nth procedure, which means uh, the answer that I would have given is um, first experiment, the answer is infinity. Second experiment, the answer is zero. Limit in both cases is the same. Limit as I approach 12 is infinity. In other words, growth without bound. Infinity is just a bad word here, right? Growth without bound in both procedures, okay? And then there is something else, guys, and let me tell you, I do have nightmares, right? I, I, they are very frequent. Actually, that's all I dream about, only nightmares. Uh, I never have any good dreams. And um, I suppose it's a punishment for my prior in the indiscretions. And uh, one thing about it is maybe you can go and go out of the room, but not in my space, not how I exist, not where I exist. Some people tell me, well, take some drugs, let's say take uh, LSD, but then you will see fractals. I don't want to see fractals. I see them anyhow without, uh, without LSD. So that's not, uh, not, not very appealing to me. Here is uh, something else. So let me explain to you why Zeno's paradox is much, much uh, more interesting. I will try to explain to you, right? So I can show you very kind of interesting pictures where that is true. Here, okay, so uh, I will try to illustrate this idea. Imagine that you are, for simplicity, right? Let's pick a very simple space. It's a one dimensional space and you have this uh, insect and it will walk from point A to point B in one second on this one dimensional space. Imagine that you're viewing this on a very flexible screen, one that you can stretch and fold and uh, basically as long as you don't tear it apart, it will continue to function, make sense? So in other words, imagine you stretch the screen uh, how long will it take the bug to walk from point A to point B? It will take the bug the same amount of time, presumably, right? Because you just stretch the screen. You do it all the time when you play with your uh, feature. So you can stretch my screen, you can make it flatter, wider. So imagine you can do that with the image in any way you like. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying so far? You agree with what I said? Now what you're going to do, you're going to divide uh, this uh, screen into three segments and then the middle segment, essentially you, re you replace, or you can fold it, whatever you like thinking, uh, by uh, two segments of the same length. So this is of length one third of the screen. Now uh, you replace it by two thirds. You understand? You remove this part and you replace it by two thirds. What? How long uh, does it take the bug to move from this point to that point? Imagine it's a screen. So what I could do, I could kind of stretch it and then create and then, then create this crease and the screen continues to work. How long does it take? In other words, for this bug, the space continues to be a straight line. It's like for you, it looks like it's bent. You understand that's the, when you speak of, um, of twisted space times and all that stuff, you're essentially speaking of uh, that situation. Not quite this situation, but you know what I mean. Uh, no, Christian. Uh, it's it, for the bug, the space is straight. One second still. Make sense, guys? You understand yeah. what I mean, right? It's, it's like, imagine that you're living intrinsically within that structure, you don't notice that something was folded. It's like your universe is played around by, uh, by other dimensions. It's folding, twisting, but uh, creatures living in that universe don't notice it at least, right? So it will be one second, okay? Make sense? Wait, I got. I still got a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, if, but isn't isn't motion re relative to time? So shouldn't the motion of you going that one that A to B should also slow down? Well, it's complicated. The truly, what what happens physically is another story, right? I mean, I can give such uh, such shapes. I can discuss them in so many different ways. Uh, so such such shapes exist up to an approximation. Okay, so. I'm thinking very simply, imagine stretching a movie, right? Imagine you're watching a movie, you can make it uh, on a wider screen or on a narrow screen and everything happening there will happen basically at the same rate. So it's like a movie that you're watching, right? So of course, what I'm saying could be at some point incorrect, right? So uh, you, you see, when you, when you think of physics, physics does not have to follow your logic. It's another story, right? But you understand my idea here, right? So you, you have all played with YouTube videos, you can make them wider 
or narrower, they run the same length of time, correct? So I imagine actually just to have this very new cell phone that I can fold, what is it called? Samsung Flex or some other thing, right? So I've, it's an extremely flexible cell phone that I can stretch like rubber and fold and it still continues to show uh, the display, right? So we have one second, but the distance of my screen is what? Look at it, it, it it's now multiplied by three, three quarters, do you agree? This is one third plus one third plus one third plus one third. It's now uh, three quarters. Make sense? Now I will take each of those segments. Now they are like my uh, sub screens. I, I do the same construction that I did with my Sierpitsky carpet in a sense, right? And I, rem and I look at the middle third, I replace it by, uh, by two segments of the same length. So it was, used to be of length one over nine. Now it is uh, two nines here. Okay, so now this is four nines. Make sense? This is now four nines. I do the same for all the edges. This is four nines, four nines, four nines. Are you with me? You understood what happened here? So I, I basically, in terms of length, what happens is this used to be one, I multiplied it by four thirds. This to be, used to be one over nine. So it used to be one third. I multiplied it by four thirds and I get four over nines. All right, so the entire thing is uh, is exactly. So look at it, this is four over three multiplied by four over three would be, will be uh, four squared over three squared. That's, that's the full length of uh, this screen. And this creature will move from this point to that point, perhaps uh, within uh, one second. Are you, are you following me? And uh, here is, uh, and then you continue doing that. You see that that's called von Koch uh, curve. I'm just showing you the simplest possible curve for which uh, it's easy to visualize it, okay? So this, length is multiplied again by each of them by four over three. So now the full length is uh, four over three to the power of three. So it's four cubed divided by three cubed. The length is increasing. And you continue doing it again for those edges, you continue adding the, adding the, uh, the teeth, what do you call it, yeah? You understand what I mean, right? You continue having this uh, zigzags, good? So do you understand what happened here, guys? Now, my question is, what's the distance between this point and that point if you travel along the space? What's the distance? If I were to a particle moving uh, uh, on this curve, what would be the length uh, that I will cover? This is not the, the actual curve, you understand? You continue doing this procedure. What's going to be the length of that curve? Can you take a guess? It exactly, it's infinite. What do you think is the distance between this point and this point here? Between any, any two points, in two dimensional space, the distance between them is tiny, but what do you think is the distance within the one dimensional space between any two points on the curve? Exactly, so between any two points, take, take this point and that point, between them, the distance is infinite, any two points, right? So this is a space where to move from one point to any other, the distance you have to travel is infinity. See, I'm not sure in which space you live, definitely my space, right? My life, I, I have a groundhog day type of thing uh, where you cannot move anywhere and you are punished. Uh, you're basically also, also doing uh, the same thing that in some sense, well, for no purpose, right? So I often think I, I talk to people that don't care about what I have to say or teach uh, people that don't want to learn from me or pretty much anything else. So it's a very similar uh, situation, at least uh, in what I have to think about, right? I have to think about uh, such structures. So that became my punishment for whatever I was, was happening before. So I will let you go in one second, guys. Let me show you if you are interested just uh, to, uh, to advertise what we talked about in probability, which relates to, to limits. So this is what's probability, right? If, if you're interested in this question, I hope you will stay and we can talk a little bit about it or something else if you're, if you're curious. So I ask first the beginning question, what's, what is uh, probability if you, if you throw a coin 
what's the probability it lands heads and what do you mean by the number? And then I go into asking questions like, if something has probability zero of happening, does it mean it never happens? And are there events that have no probability at all? In other words, zero is a probability. To have probability zero is to have that probability. But are there things that have no probability? All right, so that would be it for today. And uh, I will stop uh, the recording. And if you want to hear that, we can talk about it.